juice. Vin Armani, who is a philosopher, serial tech entrepreneur, and crypto savage. He has made his living as a television star, film producer, high-end male escort, software developer, art gallerist, pirate radio station operator, DJ, music producer, and motorcycle courier. I study philosophy at Howard Anniversary. Please join me in welcoming Vin Armani. Hello, hello. Thank you, guys. Okay, so this is sort of the uh, second chapter in an extended talk. Some of you were at my talk in the morning, and some of you were not. So before we dive into this, I'll just go over a little bit so that we have some context of what we're talking about. Uh, today in this discussion, I want to talk a little bit about winning about winning politically, because I know that that's something that comes up a lot for libertarians, uh, that the mantra is always, we libertarians need to start having some wins, we need to have some political wins, certainly for the Free State Project, uh, that's a huge concern. Uh, a lot of people moved here to be politically involved. A lot, of, a lot of movers came and then run for office. But the wins are still lacking to a great degree. While every win should be celebrated, I do believe that there could be a great many more. And that I think that the first place to look, as always, when you're looking to have success, is to look to the past and look at, first off, what movement you're a part of, understand the story that you're a part of, and then look at what has worked in the past and start there. Don't reinvent the wheel start there. So my talk that, uh, earlier on today, I started out looking at, and this talk is called From Declaration to Decentralization, started with a couple of declarations, uh, and of course being here at Liberty Forum, understanding that there's a line that's definitely drawn from the Declaration of Independence to where we are right now, to the ideas of liberty that were first formed at that time, not fully formed, a first version, but a first version that clearly has been very powerful in terms of moving the entire global culture and in terms of imparting some, uh, well, in terms of imparting liberty to a great uh, swath of the world. That particular declaration taken on really almost word for word in terms of the important parts by others, and in particular the talk this morning I started out by saying that that was the Declaration of Independence for India, actually written by Mahatma Gandhi, and then carried on in terms of the actions which he called Satya Graha, which means holding on to truth, which makes a lot of sense, considering that thing, for the most part, starts with at least what we use. We hold these truths to be self-evident. So that in all of these movements, and then of course, people who know about certainly the, the biggest one in uh, the 20th century in this country, I guess people would say the biggest liberty movement that was successful to a great degree, the civil rights movement. Of course, so much of that nonviolent resistance was drawn from, and admittedly was drawn from the struggle in India, the nonviolent struggle in India, and Gandhi was certainly Martin Luther King said, well, this is the inspiration for what it is that we're doing, because it worked. Gandhi's nonviolent actions, holding on to truth, the idea that all men are created equal, they're endowed by God with certain rights, and that when a government, that governments are supposed to be there, the whole entire reason for a government is to protect those rights, and if they stop doing that, then it's also your right to change the government or to abolish it. So, the government was changed, again, in the case of the Civil Rights Movement. Most recently, I think that the, the greatest example, and which was drawn exactly from that movement, uh, definitely marriage equality, that we've seen even in the last couple of years, holding on to that. The truths evolve over time, and we get to see, oh, there's, this is broader. This is broader than just speech, and assembly, and religion, and, uh, the government not being able to just barge into your house without a warrant. Well, this also extends to uh, based on color of skin. Oh, this also extends to the government doesn't get to decide 
who uh, I marry and who I love. So it continues to extend. This is the project of liberty. And so what I, talk, what I want to talk about today is I want to go over some of the issues that we're dealing with right now to move it forward because we've gotten there. Like this, this is a long way. This is a very long way, but it's all based on a principle. And the idea is if the first version would have gotten it right, then we wouldn't even be dealing with these issues now. These are all bugs in the system. And the example that I gave was, it's just things that you don't think about. And because they didn't have a fully articulated uh, principle, the idea that, so here we have this Bill of Rights, and it goes through and it says, yeah, freedom of speech, religion, the press, that's key because the press was relatively new, and the idea that, uh, you know, that this was a powerful political form that needed to not be suppressed, that had only existed for a few hundred years up to that point. But they would never have thought, you know, for those people who are interested in, well, we definitely need to do something about the drug war, marijuana prohibition for sure to start there. A lot of these guys were hemp farmers. They never would have thought for a million years that the government would come in and say, oh, you absolutely, we're going to pick some plants and you absolutely cannot grow those plants on your land. The government before had taken people's land. But when it was actually your land, up until that point, governments weren't really big on, oh, well, you can't grow this one particular species of plant. Not forget about growing. You can't even hold on to it. If we catch you holding on to this species of plant, you're going to jail. So why would they write that in? So this is moving through, and what I'd like to move through is this idea that it would be nice if this is the new experiment that maybe we could learn also from the mistakes of the past and say, okay, what is it that we really want to hold on to as the truth so that we don't have to do this again? So that it's not just picking out one issue and say, well, uh, we got the, we got the uh, different skin color thing. We got that. We're good. And then it's like, uh, didn't get the I can marry anybody that I want. Oh, 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 let's deal with I can get marry anybody I want. We're good. Uh, didn't deal with I can't uh, consume this plant that is actually great medicine for me and that like I actually need. Oh, let's deal with that one. And the reason why we're going to keep coming back to these, and as society changes faster and faster, there's going to be more. Now what are we dealing with? On Tuesday, they just started talking about regulated cryptocurrency. Well, we're going to have to deal with that one again. But maybe we don't have to. Maybe if we hold on to truth. So the truth that I said that is my Satyagraha, the reason that I'm moving here, saying Satyagraha, holding on to truth. The truth that I'm holding on to, as I've thought about this, as I've written about this, and the one that I think that if we hold on to this truth, that we know our political position. And I believe that it's the political position that everybody in this room essentially holds and would not disagree with. And mine is, I do not have the right to violently restrict another adult's ability to peacefully live, to peacefully do X. So, freedom of speech. I do not have the right to violently restrict another adult individual's ability to peacefully speak their mind, to peacefully write down their opinions, to peacefully worship uh, in the way that they so see fit, to peacefully gather together with their friends, to peacefully hold on to uh, whatever kind of property they want to, to peacefully uh, go into a business and transact business regardless of their color. To peacefully marry the person of their choice. To peacefully grow and consume and possess a plant. So I want to just go over some of the, just a few of the existing the existing struggles or the existing fights that are right here that perhaps some people in the room who are, I don't know if there's any legislators in the room, but some of them may actually be some of the ones involved with these things. And look at, if we move away from the preferences of we're dealing with this one issue, and we move on to the principles that we're holding on to truth, how does this look different? 
Because the only way that liberty has moved forward is holding on to truth. And every single time that people have decided they were going to hold on to truth, with no exceptions, it's won. Every time. So, of course, uh, what? let's do this. So this one, just in the last couple of weeks, I guess this is pending in the House right now. Uh, this is House Bill 1753, an act reducing the age for legally possessing alcohol, okay? I know that for some people in the Free State Project, this has been some legislative action that people would like to see happen. Let's reduce the drinking age. And up until now, you know, when I, t I talk to people about this, they say, well, what are the classic things that they say? They say, well, you can be in, in, in the military, you can be drafted into the military, but you can't have a drink. You can be tried as an adult, but you can't have a drink. And then on the other side, the argument is, coming from the people who are like, let's not reduce it, well, you may not know this, but if a state has a drinking age that is below 21, they get 10% less highway funds from the federal government. In this particular state, that equals out to $17.5 million. So, it's literally, who built the roads? Maroads! That's why I started with this one, because it's maroads. And as libertarians, we love dealing with maroads. So, what? Put in, put in by a free stater? Awesome. Good. The what is absolutely right. Let's reduce the drinking age. That's a great what, that we should be doing that. The why, though. So, what is the bill? <laughs> so basically, you can see the only change in this thing is, so here we're going to do an amendment. Uh, we're going to take it from, say, 21 down to 20. And I'll tell you right now, the why in this case, is wrong if we're holding on to truth. Because what's the truth? What is the truth that we're holding on to? Well, we just went over it. Very easy. I do not have the right to violently restrict another adult individual's ability to peacefully purchase and consume the beverage of their choice. And if all men are created equal, if I don't have that right, Neither does anybody else, because our rights are granted to us, endowed to us by our Creator. If we're going to play that game, and as libertarians, that's the game we're playing, guys. That's the game of liberty. That's the blueprint. So, what does this look like? What does this look like if we're holding on to truth? Well, that's not 20. That's not 20, unless you're not an adult until you're 20. So, the reason is not because you can be drafted into the military. The reason is not because you can be tried as an adult. The reason is because you're an adult. And I don't have the right to violently restrict your ability to purchase and consume the beverage of your choice, and you don't have the right to restrict my ability to peacefully do the same. And that's the game we're playing. So, if this is 18, and that's our satyagraha, that is the truth that we're holding on to, and the guy on the other side stands up, well, who is he? Well, he's the guy who says, uh-uh, I have the right to violently restrict everyone's ability. All of you adults, I have the right to restrict your ability to purchase and consume the beverage of your choice, violently, with violence. That's just a psychopath. And that's how you win. Because now it's not about maroons. Is it worth $17.5 million? Is it worth $17.5 million to say that you're gonna allow some group some individual out there, well, what if it's milk? I don't think you should drink milk. I'm lactose intolerant. 
I don't think anybody should drink milk. Well, we already have that. Raw milk. Already have it. So if you're a raw milk person, any, uh, any raw milk? We got any raw milk? Yeah, drinking age. <laughs> Same fight. Same fight. But if, well, we got raw milk. Okay, we handle raw milk. Oh, but drink it, age. No. It's the same fight. It's the same principle. Because even if you get raw milk, even if you get alcohol, it's going to be the next thing, and it's going to be the next thing, and it's going to be the next thing, unless you solve it from principles in the first place. Let's look at this one. This is a win. This is actually a win. Now, I don't, know the, I don't know exactly the why, but the what is totally on point. And this is what I would call enshrinement. This is so rare. And this particular bill right here is something that everyone here should be incredibly proud of, and this should serve as a model for what you're doing moving forward. <laughs> enshrinement. Saying the government cannot touch this. These are the things you cannot touch, just like the things that made this country what it is. Cannot, will make no law, Congress will make no law respecting the freedom of speech, religion, assembly, the press. And in this case, a modern version of it. Let's go. Come on. Did it to me again, Jack. And this is, this is when you know that you got it right, because the bill is really, really small. When you're holding on to truth, the bill is really, really small. Persons who engage in the business of selling or issuing payment instruments or stored value solely in the form of convertible virtual currency, cryptocurrency, or receive convertible virtual currency for transmission to another location, these people are exempted they are in the 71, they are exempted from registering as, as an exchange by state law. They're left alone. They're left alone. That's enshrinement. So, let's start adding exemptions. Raw milk, exemption. You're exempted from those laws. Now, Maine tried it. Maine tried it recently. Feds came down. But again, it's hold on to truth. Like, are we ready to do this or not? Uh, so this is, I just got back on Tuesday, found myself at an invite only uh, little, uh, what, 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 what would I call it? It was a, I, will, I like to call it a conclave. It was a uh, strategy session for thieves. In Reno, Nevada, about half of the people there were either elected or appointed officials, and they were having a conference about the blockchain. And they were having a conference about this bill, which was signed in Nevada, which basically exempted. So, what does it do? Section 1 defines the term blockchain. I think that's probably a good idea to do in New Hampshire, by the way. It's probably a good idea to actually define it in the law so that we can draw a circle around it and say you will not touch it. Two. Uh, section 3 uh, includes the blockchain within the definition of electronic records. Also probably a good idea. That means if it's a contract on the blockchain, it's a legal contract. Probably a good idea. Sections 4 and 6, this I could not believe. And this bill was unanimously passed in both houses and signed by the governor immediately prohibits a local government from, this is crazy, one, imposing a tax or fee on the use of a blockchain, two, requiring a certificate license or permit to use a blockchain, and three, imposing any other requirement. Cities and counties, hands off. You can't charge a tax, you can't require a license, you can't charge a fee or any other requirement. You can't even say how I structure my blockchain. Nothing. Now, what I heard, that, you know, I saw this when it first went through, 398, and I was like, oh, that's great. When I saw what it was really about, 
they're going to open up the doors, let all these companies come in, and then this particular thing was all about, okay, at what speed do we start squeezing? We've cut the revenue off from the cities and counties, so here at the state, we get to get all the theft. How fast or how slow do we squeeze this thing? Like, let them all in. It's that, you know, it's the crack dealer. It's the first, uh, the first hit is free. Bring in the jobs, bring in the capital. Then we'll just, uh, we'll take our little piece. But, if done right, if holding on to truth, here's an example at least. Here's an example of some places to start and to start now. This is an interesting one. This is one near and dear to my heart, having been in the escort industry and knowing a bit about it. This is about, uh, and I know that this is a big, that this is a big cause, sex workers' rights, and also, you know, this is a big one for libertarians. You know, it's like drugs, prostitution, victimless crime. Okay, so let's hold on to truth. Let's hold on to truth. If we're this, if we're using that same model, is I don't have the right to violently restrict another adult individual, or two, or three, or depends on what you're into. <laughs> Any number of adult individuals' ability to peacefully interact with each other in an intimate manner. Regardless of what the exchange is. Because it certainly is not my right. I don't think any of you would think that it is. If a woman says, well, I'm not going to have sex for God until marriage. And I'm not going to marry you unless you get down on your knees and give me a ring. And it had better be a fantastic wedding. What's the real functional philosophical difference between that and I'm, I will sleep with you tonight, but I'm not going to do it unless you pay me $500. It's an exchange. It's an exchange. It's a contract. Now, as much as your own personal preference may be for one or the other, the question that you have to ask yourself is, do you have the right to violently restrict another individual's ability to peacefully decide which of those contracts they want. Are you going to take that on to yourself? So, if that's the case, this bill should be really small. If you really want it to pass, and if you're going to use principle, and if you're going to stand up and say, if you're opposed to this bill, then you believe that you have a right to violently determine who I can and cannot have an intimate relationship with. Well, I assume you're probably against marriage, marriage equality too. Right? You must be one of those bigots, because that's really what that's based on, isn't it? It's the same thing. But, unfortunately, that's not what was laid out here. Pretty convoluted. Best of intentions. Best of intentions. But not holding to the truth. This is what it probably should have looked like. First thing, prostitution and related offenses, the entire thing, remove it. Because what is prostitution if we're operating this way? It doesn't even exist. It's a voluntary exchange between two individuals that I have absolutely no right to violently restrict. And then there's an old section in New Hampshire that just mentions common prostitutes. Just take it out. This is for the cities and towns, what they did. So you kind of do the same thing with the blockchain law that you say, yeah, cities and towns, you can't touch that either. Old, old part. Which takes us to this. So just take the word prostitution out and you're done. Now, some people would, be, would say, well, but especially in this last one, well, we got to cover, you know, what if there's coercion, right? There, there, there could be pimps. Like, what if there's coercion? Well, that's fantastic. Is it legal for anyone to coerce you to go to your job? Is it legal for anyone to say, go to work and punch you in the face? No, slavery is illegal. 
Kidnapping's already illegal. Assault is already illegal. Rape is already illegal. They're all illegal. And by the way, the penalties are a whole lot more than what's being suggested in the prostitution code. If someone beats a woman and tells her that she needs to sleep with somebody, I would rather that he got assault and kidnapping charges rather than a pimping and pandering charge. Because a pimping and pandering charge, he's going to be out in a day. I'd rather he got kidnapping and assault. And if it was bad enough, that he's away for life. Those are the people who should be away for life. So, brings us to this. Right? There's a discussion, why is weed not legal in New Hampshire? I'm coming from a state where it's legal. I'm glad that it's not legal yet. It would be fantastic if we could actually do this the right way. It would be fantastic if we could actually step up to the plate and be an example for liberty and say, I do not have the right to violently restrict another adult individual's ability to grow, possess, and consume plants. Plants. Because which plant is just a preference? If you say that you have the right to restrict one plant, you're saying that you have the right to pick and choose which plants. And I'm pretty sure you don't want to live in the world where that's the case. Because you eat plants. So, so far, long, long bill, long. That's how you know it's completely unprincipled. Long bills are unprincipled. Principled bills, the 14th Amendment that ended slavery is one sentence. Liberty's short, man. Liberty is real easy, man. It always has been. Because when you get it, it's real simple. So we've got this long one. So what do we got? A little bit of decriminalization. Reducing the penalty for possessing three quarters of an ounce or less. So we choose the amount. Well, it's a arbitrary. Three quarters? Why not half? Why not an ounce? What's the difference? And so we go down and it's like, but still, still, just like in Nevada, say, oh, the weed is legal. Weed is legal in Nevada. If you're 21. So it's still completely illegal for a huge percentage of adults in Nevada to walk around with weed in their pocket. 18, 19, 20 years old, which happen to be the ones who were the most getting arrested for it anyway. So what does this look like? What does a principled stab at dealing with marijuana look like? I'll tell you what it looks like. I should see as much mention of the word marijuana in the criminal code as I do of spinach. <laughs> That's what liberty looks like. That's what it looks like. Now, if even a few people are willing to hold on to that truth, what I'm going to tell you is that a buzz like none other will rise up around this state. No longer when I read the news coming from out of here about these bills will I hear, basically I can hear the people talking about it laughing. Laughing. It's a hodgepodge of bad ideas. I read that one the other day. It's just crazy in that New Hampshire. They're a bunch of lunatics. They don't know what they're doing. They'll just throw anything against the wall and see if it sticks. Except no. Except when people decide to hold on to truth, and you realize every single one of these bills come from the exact same place, and you, you argue them with the exact same principle. Everyone. And that's how you start moving them back. So, I don't want to take up too much time with my talking, but I wanted to finish out the, uh, the little section so that we could show some ways to actually move forward. As I said, I'm moving here in April. 
I don't vote. I don't vote. I'm an anarchist. I don't expect for you guys to be at that point and hold on to that. But I will tell you that I, I am planning on being heavily politically involved. And anybody that is willing to stand for principle, that is willing to do this in the way that it's... And here's the reason why. The what is great, but when you get the why right, as you've seen, the why, then it's sustainable and it's repeatable. You can do it over and over and over and over again, and you can keep chipping out at the walls of oppression and bring liberty step by step by step by step by step. And anybody that's willing to stand and do that, I am going to stand with you. That's what I'm devoted to, and that's why I've decided to come here. So that's the end of my talk, but I would love questions, comments, Anybody, the mic is, uh, mic is here for you, so if you have questions, comments. I know there are some people who have some questions. Go ahead and, go ahead and ask them. No? So I love what you're saying, the whole, you know, finding the core principle and going on with it. Um, you're talking about this legislative work. Uh, speaking as someone who has lots of years of practical experience, the purest argument doesn't move a lot of legislators. So, you know, three quarters of an ounce, 18, 21 years, I mean, that's, it's an incrementalist approach. But, so what do you say to the idea that once you get the velocity moving in the right direction, that we can get to that, like you're trying to do, do 100% at once, versus, you know, doing 20% over, you know, each revolution. So what's your, what's your thought on taking this more pragmatic approach to get where you want to get? If by pragmatic you're referring to the idea of not operating on principle, here are the two issues that you have with that. One, you're going to lose. I'm just going to say that straight up. This, 20, this moving this to 20 years old is going to lose. The problem that you have is you have a problem of, of inconsistency that people can see right away. And that's why holding on to truth, that's why Gandhi walking and simply just making salt in violation of the, the salt laws, or the freedom riders going down and sitting in. That's why it works. Now they could have started at one place that was like a little less segregated and just started there and been like, well, if we get this one, then we'll move down to this one. Move, no, they didn't do that. In fact, Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail, the letter itself is an answer to the other clergy who said, why did you come to Alabama? You're not from here? Go back to Atlanta, which at the time was much more progressive in terms of race relations. His entire answer is the answer to what you're saying. He said, because that's where it's at. You go to the place where the injustice is at. You do the research, then you purify yourself. These are his words. And then you stand for justice. You go to the heart of what it is. So, you don't go 20, okay, well we got 20, now next time we'll go 19, then next time we'll go 18. But what's the reason? Because if the reason is that I can't tell another adult what beverages to purchase and consume, well then 20 is not going to cut it. Because 18 is an adult. We've decided 18 is an adult. And if we're going to decide that, that's where we got to go. So it's a question of logical and moral consistency. And the fact of the matter is that no one, people get it, people get it. Even if they don't have a philosophy background, they don't have a political background. Pragmatism is horse trading. But most people don't care about the political horse trading. You know, you take a look, and if you're going to lose, lose on principle. Ron Paul, Dr. No, right? Did he win any of those no votes? There were some votes where he was the only no vote. Pragmatism, Dr. Paul. Pragmatism. And yet, and yet, I talk to libertarians between the age of, say, 35 and 45, and I say, oh, what brought you to liberty? Ron Paul 2008, Ron Paul 2008, Ron Paul 2008. 
He won none of those fights, but did he lose? Would pragmatism have brought anybody to the cause of liberty in the way that his lack of pragmatism and his holding on to the truth did? And if the goal of this project is to get people to come here, I'm not a signer. I didn't sign. I've talked to a lot of people who are like, I moved here, or I'm moving. I'm not a signer. I've got, but I have a cryptocurrency business. I'm a cryptocurrency advocate. That law is a big reason why I'm moving. Big. It's small wins that affect important people, and there are a lot of important people that in every sector that just need it cleared up. I guarantee you, you do an enshrinement of raw milk, you really lower some of those ages, you really do it for real, you're gonna be shocked. Pragmatism? Win a small one and see what happens. So, that's what I mean, that's my answer to that one. I, I don't know, there's no, when, it, when it's pragmatism over principle, unsustainable. Unsustainable. Really, we're done. So uh, I had a question about um, Erwin Schiff and Adam Kokesh. Okay. So they stand on the voluntarist civil disobedience kind of principles. When is it, at what level is it appropriate to push it? And when is it not? How can you decide? Because it's not just legislation, it's also, you know, whether you follow things at checkpoints and things like that. So what's that line for you? Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's actually a really good question. For me personally, I don't think that most of these things, most of these issues that we're talking about are ones where civil disobedience makes a lot of sense. Um, I think that certainly in the case of, you know, you go back to, again, these, these ideas are pulling from, you have to realize these are, ideas are pulling from a previous iteration of this idea of liberty, right? So it's pulling actually from an iteration that came out of the civil rights movement in this in the United States, right? Which then, those same tactics were used uh, to protest the Vietnam War, or the anti-war movement. But clearly, it was the same tactics being pulled from a decade earlier. The civil rights movement absolutely drawn from India. And so of course it makes sense to go out and have, if the media is looking, and Gandhi, Gandhi went out and the media was watching. Everyone was watching and he made salt. And the same thing with the marches, you know, in Selma, Alabama. Martin Luther King making speeches. The same thing with the Vietnam War. The media was on it, you know, but for one person, for you, on your own, perhaps with the, with the camera? Maybe. Maybe. Is anybody paying attention to that actual issue? How far is that going to get you? That's, that's what you have to ask yourself, is my time best spent in this scenario? The other thing that you've got to consider is, is my time best spent becoming known when what I'm trying to do, what becoming known as a, a, a civil disobeyer, right? Being on the radar of the people who are gonna who are gonna fuck with you, quite honestly. <laughs> like that's their job. So you have to ask the question, like, what is this accomplishing? Gandhi knew what was about to happen. It was planned out. The civil rights organizers were organized. They planned the specific cities at the specific times. They had tactics. Right? And of course, I, don't, I would prefer civil disobedience every time that I'm in front of a TSA agent, but I also know that I can't do the things I need to do for liberty if I can't actually travel. And sometimes I'm showing up to the airport, you know, a half hour before my flight because there was traffic or whatever, and I need to get right on the plane. But if I'm that guy that's constantly detained, does that serve me? Does that serve you guys if I can't make it here? Does that serve my family? 
So that's what we have to start asking ourselves. Like, I truly believe that we have reached a time now where we don't need that because we can communicate with each other. That was a time when they needed to have mass amounts of people because there were so few media outlets that if you didn't have those masses of people, the media would not pay attention. But we don't need that. We have our own media. We can communicate these issues, but if we're gonna communicate them, we need to communicate them from a place of principle, from a place where people start to figure out that, oh yeah, that weed fight, and that prostitution fight, and that cryptocurrency fight, and that raw milk fight, those are all the same fight. If we can communicate that, then we have that mass movement already. We do. It's not disparate. So, I mean, for me personally, it's not, it's not the path. I have, I have another path. Do I believe there's a place for it? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a voluntarist. I think that we need to approach this in whichever way we're passionate about. I have great respect for the people who, who you know, will basically put themselves on the firing line for this. You know, I don't think that we need martyrs at this point. But, you know, if it brings attention, if that person, if that brings attention, I mean, Kokesh is a great example of that. I mean, without his activism in that way, he probably wouldn't be able to reach as many people as he has. It's been an integral part, but I don't think that's for everybody. He's a unique, he's an individual with a unique perspective and a great amount of charisma. And that the goal is to, to make a stand so that there's news, so that he can push a broader message forward. I don't think that it's standing, standing on its own, so. Great talk, Van, and I, I, I totally agree with your, your fundamental point that these that we should see that all these as part of the same fight: paternalist issues, you know, issues of you know regulating people's economic transactions and so on, which, between consenting as always. But I also wonder about the civil rights example. So um, you mentioned that that the fight against Jim Crow is basically the same fight as the fight for legalizing same-sex marriage, and, uh, and I agree, right, they're, they're pretty much the same fight, but of course, legalizing same-sex marriage, marriage equality was not part of the original civil rights fight. Uh, there was a reason for that, right? If it had been, if, you know, if MLK had gotten up and said, you know, we're not, we're not done here until uh, people can marry whom they love of the same sex. Never would have worked, right? People would have abandoned him in droves. Um, in fact, there were a lot of people in the 60s who thought the civil rights fight was the same fight as the fight against the Vietnam War, or the fight for the welfare state. He might have even agreed with them, but he thought, you know, we need to be focused on a, like a laser on this issue of getting rid of segregation first, right? And so how do you draw that line between, you know, here are the issues where we can make progress, we can have a principled approach on these issues. And here are the issues that, yes, once we win this, we can show people that the same logic applies over here, but they're not ready to hear that yet. And if we take that all as a package, we might not make progress. Right? So how, you know, how do you make that, that division? Of course, you're going to have some people who want the whole thing right, right away. Um, but as, a, as someone who's going to try to make a difference to actually improve freedom in people's lives, are there sort of criteria we could use there? Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's great. And I think that the point that you bring up about the civil rights movement is uh, that's actually the, the key point here is that it was, that was yet another fight that was presented as this is the one fight, right? It's this idea that all people are created equal and that means that they should all be able to go into the same building together. Well, it's since I have a dream. Right? It's the vision of that speech. Yeah. What I'm suggesting is that as we move through these individual issues, and I, since we are individualists for the most part in this room, I would assume, I'm saying if you're going to take on an issue, you take on the issue that you're so passionate about that you feel like you could work on it for the rest of your life. And it's not going to be the same one for everybody. 
but as you approach it, that you approach it from the framework of. So if it's uh, decriminalization of marijuana, right? That's the issue. It's not to say that we're not going to do intersectionality. We don't have to do that, right? That's another side that's going to say we're all oppressed, and so it's all we're all together because we're all oppressed. No. But all men are created equal, we all have the same rights. So what I'm saying is, we do the decriminalization because I don't have the right to violently restrict your ability to grow plants, and we keep the why forefront. And the reason we keep the why forefront is because we're gonna need it again on the next fight. And then we say, to all the people that supported the marijuana fight, and we had the why forward, you say, and they say, oh, well I'm not, you know, this thing, it's not my issue, and you're like, no dude, it's actually, it's this, actually the same issue. Remember why you were for marijuana? Like, you should be for raw milk too. And people are not able to keep that cognitive dissonance. Then it's a very hard point to argue if the story that we tell is that this is the reason why. It's not because it's marijuana, and it's not because you like to smoke marijuana. Maybe you don't like to smoke marijuana. But you don't think that somebody should be able to tell you whether or not you could drink raw milk. So that enables us to have these inroads into all the different ones. We take them one at a time, and this is why I'm saying the what, absolutely. We know that we can deal with all the issues, and there are unknown unknowns. There are issues that we don't even know we're gonna need to deal with, right? So, but that's what it is, and that's the whole, whole idea, and I, I thank you for that question, it's good. Two minutes. One more question. Got to be quick. I'll be fast. So, sorry, don't do this. Um, so, what about children? You all say 18 is the cutoff. What gives you the right to tell a parent what to do with their children? Then, how is that any different or sacred versus? Great. I, well, I don't, I don't think that I have the right to tell an adult what to do with their children, right? So that's part of it. I don't, don't have a right to violently uh, restrict an adult from deciding what it, how they're going to educate their child, for instance. Um, but we have to, and I don't know, like, I write about this in my book, that unfortunately in our society we don't have what past societies for millennia have, millennia have had, like a rite of passage where it wasn't age but you passed some ritual and that made you an adult, unfortunately we don't have that, right? We've decided that we're gonna do age, but whatever age we decide upon, we have decided in our society as it stands that child can't sign a contract, child can't be tried as an adult, they're not fully responsible at that point, their parents have some amount of responsibility that ends at that age. So I'm not saying that society should be telling because you'd be saying what a child should do because that infringes on the parents' rights. But that, as a parent, myself, I have a two-year-old daughter, right? So I don't believe that she has a right to tell me that she's not going to go to bed. I don't believe that she has a right to tell me that she's absolutely not going to eat something, right? No, I don't use violence against her. I'm, a, I'm her caretaker, right? But that we have to, and that's why I make that distinction of an adult. Right? I think we have a long way to go in dealing with children. I think that's something that we, I mean, this is, that's, I believe that that's probably the next fight for liberty out there for us to understand how to do this, because we, we are very, very crude about how we deal with children and how we understand children at this point. So I know that that's out there, you know, so I'm, I'm trying to deal with these, but I appreciate the question, and, and I do, and I do respect that, and I think that it's something that we all should be thinking about, so. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much.